special greetings to Jordan and Junior and William and Ronaldo. Much younger than me. <laughs> and I have a word for Freddie and Paul and Velia, Brother Hoss, Eddie, Vicky, and Beverly. My assistant pastor back here, Brother Kevin, Sister Sally, Shorty, and Mindy, Zelman, Karen, Pat and Nellie, dear Brother John, Sister Kathy, Brother Roy, and Sister Sylvia. The message this morning is called Sudden Stop. Oh, please listen with your heart. Everything we know is going to stop with a very sudden stop. And as Jesus made very plain, and so does the Word of God, most people aren't going to be ready for it. The text is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Peter verse 10 of chapter 3 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Suddenly, you'll be reaching into your wallet to get your credit card out to pay for your groceries. And it'll all be over instantly. You'll be going to pick up the phone. It's ringing and just as you look at it and see who's calling, just before you push the button, it'll, it'll end. Everything will end that quickly. I don't know how many of you are aware. Uh, April 8th. How many of you? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you are aware of the solar eclipse coming April 8th? Good. That's more than, than usual. Jesus said there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. In 2017, we had a solar eclipse. And uh, it's a total solar eclipse where the moon completely covers up the sun in certain places on the United States, on, on our soil in certain places, it will cover it to the point that it gets very creepy dark, like, like, like late in the evening, in the middle of the day. Well, in 2017, that happened, and as it took place, it moved, okay, it moved, if I'm not mistaken, from the upper northwest down to the lower southeast, just like that. April 8th. Now, now, first of all, to have one of those solar eclipses, typically you won't see one but about every 360 years. In 2017, we had one. We're about to have another one. This one will go from the southwest to the northeast. And it's, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to place an X. Yes, ma'am. It's going to place an X across the United States. Now, some of these slobbering prophecy teachers have said that there are seven cities in the United States called Nineveh in that path. They're not. But there are two. There are two. An X across the United States. Many people are tying a lot of things. And there's, you can stretch and you can make a lot of things appear almost anything. But let me tell you something. God has given us lots of signs. He's given us warning signs. He's given us some warning signs. Oh, I hate to reference secular movies, but this one was just, this was just too in your face. Those of you that saw Oh God with Jim Carrey. And he's, he's just screaming out in desperation to hear from God. And he's just screaming behind it. He's driving. He's saying, just give me a sign, God. If you just give me a sign, give me a sign. And he's behind a, a, a road worker truck that's filled with signs. And they all say, stop, detour. And they're flashing. And he's saying, just give me a sign, God. And I suggest God's given us so many signs today that he's winding things up and that we've got to awaken. We've got to move forward. I believe that we're inundated with signs I know we are because my heart has gotten tender to see them. But I also know our society is just blind as we can be to it. How many of you are familiar with the 
acronym, or it's not even an acronym, the initial CBDC. CBDC. Google, and it'll pop straight up. Central Bank Digital Currency. Some of you are more familiar now. This is done. This is already in place. Today, today it could be determined if the decision makers were to decide that cash is done. You're done with it. The bank's over. And everything's going to be central bank, digital currency. We use digital currency 90% of the time now. Every time you use your debit card, every time you use your phone, anytime, <laughs> anytime you're not reaching in your pocket pulling out a saw buck, you're using digital currency. But we're not using a central bank yet. But that's already done. It's already there. Did you know that? Because do you realize that's all it takes? That is the final, please listen, that's the final step that had to be taken in order to achieve the mark of the beast. I'm not saying that's what it is. But I'm saying once central banks, digital currency is put into place, you will not buy and you will not sell anything unless you have a vehicle to operate with the central bank's digital currency. And it's going to be sold worldwide. Everybody's going to swallow it up and just say this is the greatest thing in the world because you can no longer have somebody meet somebody on the street and take 20 pounds of marijuana across and get cash money for it. You can't do that anymore. If there's any compensation at all, it's going to be done digitally and it's tracked. That's already in place. Did you know that? Oh! Again, your phone could be ringing and you look at it and see it selling. Just as I go to touch it, it's over. Just like that. And God's given us signs upon signs upon signs saying, be ready, be ready, be ready. We're not ready. We're not ready. The people of God, we don't have soft, aching hearts for the lost. We don't have soft, aching hearts for our own families. We, we have... We have Emotions, we care. The mark of the beast. Oh, we're going to look at that in just a minute in Revelation. But first, let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you're still in 2 Peter, just go back to the left a few books. If you go to Thessalonians, you're going too far. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read 1 through 7. Some of you, if you go to this church, you've heard this before. But you're going to hear this. I want you to just hear and picture in your mind what we're saying. Verses 1 through 7. Paul is talking to young Timothy. This is the last letter that Paul writes before he's executed. And he knows he's about to be executed. That's addressed in chapters, chapter 4, verse 6, 7, and 8. But here in chapter 3, he's talking to Timothy, knowing he's about to be put to death. And he's got everything invested in this young disciple, Timothy. Timothy is a leader in the church. And he says, now this know also. In the last days, perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. He's talking mostly here about the church people. He's talking about us. He's saying beware. Unholy means not set apart. You just fit right in with everybody else. I will stop there just for a minute. I want, I want to... Here's what I'm pitching before I close this message this morning. Here's what I'm pitching. I hate to put it like that, but I came up through sales. What I'm presenting to you is we're going to have to put on the uniform of children of God. We're going to have to start looking different, talking different, acting different, preferring different things, going different places, and standing out in a crowd and getting a little bit of the persecution that Jesus said would, not might, but would follow those who follow his name. Guys, if you're not going through anything right now, if your life is easy and your Christianity doesn't irritate anybody you know, you're not doing it right. That's a strange thing to tell you, isn't it? But it's in your Bible. If you're holy, holy means set apart. But if you just fit right in with everybody else, if you can go to the same movies they go to, go to the same 
restaurants with the beer and whiskey all flying around and profanity all going around the football games up on us. You don't belong there. That's, that's, that's not us. Not holy. He says we'll be unholy without natural affection. Boy, we see that everywhere. This sexual thing that's going on right now makes the 60s look like a, like a subtle cartoon. And I remember in the 70s and 80s still hearing the older generation talk about what a mess, what, what a mess we'd gotten into because suddenly everybody's shacking up and not marrying in the 70s after the 60s sexual revolution. And now they're demanding to be married to the same sex. It's horrible what we've gone through. It's, it's, and it's in the church. Look how many churches are, are voting and, and, and pushing this agenda into the church. Unholy. Be like the world. Be like the world. Keep going. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. That means they have no self-control. Preaching to me with everybody else. Lent has been a little difficult at times. I've got to admit I've been creative, but I haven't broken it. I want to be loyal. Self-control is hard to come by anymore. I cry out for it. We need it. If you've never fasted, you need to fast sometime. We've got to learn how to fast and pray. We've got to come out from among them. We've got to get some self-control in our lives. Oh, I still remember, and we were, we were seeking the Lord when this first happened. It's probably been eight or nine years ago. But when we got our first DVR, we thought, how can we possibly live without a DVR? We're going to miss without a trace tonight if we go over so so. But we can record it now. No self-control. Those kind of things would ruin my week if I missed. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Incontinent. Fierce despisers of those that are good. That's in the church, too. But let's not focus on those things. Just keep following. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. I don't need to expound on that. Just mark that in your Bible. For of this sort are they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, Led away with diverse lusts. Is he picking on a woman? Ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. Let me tell you what the Lord revealed in my heart that that means. Because it's not just what you see right off on the surface. It can be that as well. This is the sort. These, 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 these Christians that he's talking about here. That are high minded, heady. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. But they have a form of godliness. These are pastors, TV ministers, such as that. I was talking to somebody just a couple of days ago. Two men who, all like all men, they've got their religion down straight, but they don't ever darken the door of a church, got a filthy mouth, smell of booze on their breath most of the time. And I'm talking when they said something about the old days. I said, that's why there's nothing but women hardly in the church anymore. How come it's full of women? How come there aren't any men? Don't you gripe about how it used to be if you don't even darken the door of a church and you let your wife go carry all of it. These guys that he's talking about here in 2 Timothy prey on women who don't have a man being a covering in their home. And they wind up getting tithes from them. They get gifts from them. They fill a church with these women. And these women, look at it, ever learning and never coming to a true knowledge of the truth. Because they're hearing something that's filling a void, but they don't have a covering. And God set this up one way. If you don't have a man in your life, Christ will be your covering. And you come under that. And if you do, then he's to be your covering. And he needs to be covering you in church. And he needs to be making you feel comfortable seeking God. But that's who he's talking about. Sister Kathy and I were talking about TBN, how it used to be a long time ago. And, and such as that. Look at any of these TV ministries and such. And you'll find, if you went in and looked at it, most of the money that comes in that supports these huge mega empires. Women writing the checks. Women writing the checks. And the husband just, whatever, whatever. It's happening right there. We're in these days. Go to Second Peter now. Go back to the, to the right where we were. And we're going to look a little bit deeper at the passage that we just touched on. Second Peter chapter 3, 
First, start at verse 3, read 3 and 4. Listen to what it says. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Knowing this, now this is Peter talking about the same thing Timothy was just being told by Paul. And Peter says, knowing this, that there will come in the last days. Here again, the Word of God is trying to tell us, wake up, because this is all going to come to a stop just like that. It's going to stop so fast. And then all of the things that you're wishing you could do, all of, the, all of the words you're wishing you could get, that you're wishing you could get enunciated to your kids or to your family, all the things that you wish you had the nerve to say, it's going to be too late. It's over. It'll be done in a second. But he's telling us in the last days, there's going to come scoffers walking after their own lusts. And they'll be saying, where's the promise of his coming? You're talking about Jesus coming back all the time. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Listen, that's supposed to be one of the signs of the last days. And we are so far past that. Do you realize only a fool, only a fool could stand and tell you things are like they've always been. Nothing's like it's always been. The last 250 years look nothing like all history before it. The last 250 years look nothing at all like all before them. We're in the last days. Am I trying to tell everybody Jesus is coming back today? I have no idea, and I don't preach that. But I'll tell you this. Paul thought it was going to be before he went to bed each night. And he changed the world for Jesus Christ. We're so sure that they're just a little worked up and they're taking that scripture out of context. And that's well, but, but Israel hasn't rebuilt the third temple yet, so it's not going to happen yet. Just keep talking. Just keep talking. That phone's going to ring sometime or another before you can touch it. There's going to be a loud noise like a thief in the night. And the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works therein shall be burned up. It's going to happen so fast. Sister Sally said something once when we were talking about that that has stuck with me so about the time warp and God's sovereignty and of all the, all the prophecies that still need to be fulfilled. Jesus is prophecy. When the Father says, go get my bride, all prophecy will be fulfilled just like that. And he'll come back. There is nothing that you can hold your Bible and point to and say, this gotta ha- this got to happen before Jesus can come back. What a fool. God is a God of absolute order. And he, does every- he puts it all in his prophecy for you to see first. But for somebody to say what God can and can't do. When he's given us so many signs that say, my children. I've talked about this before. What a special. I named every one of you by name. What a special group of people you are to be living in this day and time do you not realize the apostles were not equipped for what we're living in this is a totally different existence i saw something the other day reading in revelation and we'll probably talk about on the bible read tomorrow night that gave me chills when it's talking about and some of these things personal opinion and i'm not teaching this as doctrine but personal opinion I believe something started in major motion back when steam and electricity and combustible engines all in, within a matter of 40 years all hit and suddenly it turned into this. I believe something happened then. It talks about the beast in Revelation chapter 18 calling down fire from the sky and then performing all kinds of wonders and miracles. How many of you can remember when you were in elementary seeing a picture of Benjamin Franklin with a little string and a key on it and a kite and electricity hit it and he pulled fire down out of the sky and since then I can look at my phone and say hey Google what year was electricity discovered and boom it's telling me right here it's coming up you stop listening to me unless you're going to repent I'm telling you what else do we need for signs God's got all of this in control. But he gave every one of us. You can't imagine the starch 
that he put in you that's available if you'll reach inside and access it that God put in you that wasn't in we think we're so soft and we are in so many ways I've got to have an electric blanket I need I need a better air conditioner I need a softer chair we think that we're so soft in that way and we are in those ways but God also put something in every one of us to be able to go as men and women of God through the most the most sin riddled formation this earth has ever seen ever seen this whole virtual reality and artificial intelligence and such as that, man will be able to, and then and, and, and sometimes I think without even knowing, be having sexual relationships with machines and, and, and equipment. And it'll be no different than a human being in another 20, 30 years. This stuff is already done. I mean, they, they, they have these kind of things. The image it talks about in Revelation that will speak. That's easy. That's easy. And it'll have access to all data on all the clouds. It'll have all the pictures of your grandbabies. It'll know who's who. It'll know what you posted. It'll know what you thought about the last person that ran for president. What you had to say about them. It's all there. It's all stored. If you've ever said it, texted it, emailed it, it's saved. Going down to verse 8. Through 12, we'll read 10, which was the text again. But listen to this. Just follow along. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise about sending his son back. He's not slack. But he's long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now listen, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, I can just see him, and there was nothing there. Peter's talking, and there was nothing there. Maybe there was a chariot and a donkey. And he says, all these things will be dissolved. He had no idea the things that would be dissolved. I'm going to tell you again, this sounds so funny because you don't think I'm an Amish. I admire them now and I used to make fun of them. All of this stuff is made to distract us from the living God. All of it is. That's why people give their whole lives and they bury themselves in the pursuit of more and more and more of this stuff that's obsolete by the time they die. Oh, let's wake up. All these things will be dissolved. So what manner of persons ought you be in all holy conversation and godliness? Your whole life, my whole life, should be about one thing. Holiness and godliness. Holiness and godliness. Yo, holier than thou. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Oh, you think you're better than me. No, I'm sure not trying to be better than anybody. I'm trying to be what he called me to be, though. And I can't let your insults slow me down. And I can't let your thoughts of what I'm doing get in my way. Oh. Last night we were listening to a preacher from 41 years ago. And it was still in color. <laughs> they used to be black and white. And he'd written a book called Worse Than Hell and Better Than Heaven. And I thought, what are you talking about? And he didn't get to the better than heaven. I can see where he was going once he said this. And he said, worse than hell. And I thought, there can't be anything worse than hell. And he used scripture. And he talked about Lazarus and the rich man. And he talked about that rich man in the flames of hell. And he cried, Father Abraham, put some water on my tongue. Have Lazarus put some water on my tongue and save me from this torture. And Abraham says, there's nothing I can do for you. There's a great chasm between us. I can't come there. You can't come here. So what did he cry? What did he say? He says, if you can't save me, send somebody to tell my kids not to come to this horrible place. Tell my brothers don't fall into this mess. Send somebody. It's worse than hell. Imagine being in the flames and torment of hell 
and just horrified into everything you've always heard that it would be and you think it can't be worse this is awful forever and ever and then you look and see your grandbaby in the same fiery hell and realize I just played with them and loved them I didn't want to make them uncomfortable and tell them about Jesus we got to wake up. We're in the last days. We have all these signs. There's an X coming across our nation next month. That means nothing. It may not. But I'll tell you what, it means a lot to this old preacher. It's just another sign. It's not one I'm hanging my hat on and walking around with a sandwich board on. I do that anyway. But it's something else that's putting a little more fire under me. I believe God's sending all kinds of signs to tell us. I think the fires up north are a sign for us. I think Katrina was a sign. 9-11 was a sign. God sent my people. Don't you read your Bible? We just finished reading about Ezra and Nehemiah, Zerubbabel and Jeshua putting the temple back together after God had spent centuries Warning his children and warning his children and warning his children. And they, we're the people of God. God would never do that to us. And he leveled the city where he put his own name. We're getting signs. But we're the people. You can hear me talking to you. And I've got every one of you prayed up enough. I know it's going in your heart. So don't act like you don't hear me this morning. God is telling us. Come out from among them and be ye separate. This has got to be a church where when we open the floor up, everybody wants to tell something what God's done. You've got to. It's how we overcome the enemy. The blood of the Lamb has washed us now the word of our testimony. Without it, you're impotent. And you want to see impotence? Just look at the church across this country as the darkness rolls over it. It's time we stand up. Well, I don't want somebody to say, why do you care what they think? They may be the one person. They may be the one person that hears what you have to say. And they mock and spurn you and go off on their own and wind up getting saved under the conviction of the Holy Ghost. But we'll never know if we play it safe. We can't do that anymore. We can't do that anymore. I know you're hearing this in your heart. We can't do that anymore. You, we've got to be different. With every one of us got to be different. And you're going, to, you're, going to know, you're going to know you're doing it right if it looks like the Bible. And Jesus said, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. He said in Matthew 24, they'll hate you because of my name. They're so sick of hearing you say, Jesus is. Christ saved me. New life in Jesus Christ. They're so sick of hearing that, they'll hate you. If it were against the law to be a Christian, would there be any evidence to pick you up? We've got to hear this. We've got to be known for that one thing. That's the, that's the only thing. What else do I have to tell anybody about? What do I have to brag to anybody about? I could go on about my accolades in the past. That's what they are, is the past. And they almost blinded me and took me plumb off the road to ever finding my way into Christ. That's what they're there for. But praise His holy name. He didn't give up on me. And now I'll not shut up. I'll not stop talking about it. And I'll not quit looking for places to go tell people about it. And I just don't care what people think about it anymore. If my prayers aren't being answered, if people around me aren't being saved, if the church isn't flourishing, if I'm silent about my witness... If there are those that I still hold ought against. If there's any unforgiveness in my heart. I'm not ready for that thief in the night to come back. Some of you. This is a message that we heard last night. Oh he went back and he preached on. After the children of Israel had taken down Jericho. Then they went after they were told don't keep anything. Give it all to the Lord. Then they went at a little bitty place called Ai. <laughs> Ai. Can you believe that, Shorty? Yeah. That's the name of the town. And they lost 36 men, got whipped. Had to keep man. Joshua was like, we just took out Jericho. What's the deal? There was one man. One man in the camp. 
had taken some goodies when they took down Jericho and he hid it in his tent. One man in the camp had sin and it cost 36 men their life. How many of you have unconfessed sin in your heart? Maybe from 40, 50 years ago and you're just hiding that, that's covered, that's okay. I'm doing good since then. God knows my heart. And you're wondering why you can't get your prayers answered in the family. Wondering why nobody hears. Wondering why you just can't seem to get that, that I'm right there but I can't ever seem to cross over that this glass ceiling I just can't get get that sin out you've got to go back and get the sin out God will never say he's a gracious God he's a loving God he sent his only son and he died on a cross and he died for everybody prostitute drug dealer murderer child molester died for every one of them but God will not tolerate your sin that's why it took the blood of his son to get me to where I could even stand in his presence. I have to be covered in the blood of his precious son before I can even stand there because of a sinful nature. How much worse to have hidden sin that I hold on to that I'm certain nobody knows about and it's over now. That's over. There's nothing I can do about it now. There is something you can do about it. You can get it out. Get it out of there. Let God have his way in your life. Because just like that, just like that, it's going to be over. Sudden stop. It's going to be a sudden stop. If you're listening online, if you're visiting, if you're going to a dead church, get out. If you're going to a church that's not teaching you the Bible and trying to stir you into holiness, get out! Get out! You, we, and Sally and I constantly, you will see our YouTube viewing. It's all we do. When we're not studying and reading in the Word. Well, that's all you do. That's all you, well, you're a preacher. You can do that. You make room for what you want to do. If you're not getting fed, you better get where you can get fed. These are those days, guys. These are those days, and we have got to step up. We've got to hear what the Lord says. We've got to fall on our knees today. We've got to confess our sinful hearts before God. Listen, we've got to deny all opposition and push back from self, family, and friends. This is, here's your invitation. I've still got a little while before I get there, but here's the invitation. Here's the meat of it. Hear this again. You're going to have to deny all opposition. Anything, any reason why I shouldn't just sell completely on out and say, that's it. My wife and I don't get on our knees together ever. But we're going to today. We're going to today and we're starting from now on. I never get on my knees, but I'm going to today. I never speak up when it's time to talk about what this church used to be an all black folks church. And I, I know the pastor, and I visited his church, and I preached at his church in Lubbock. And before they'll start, they'll open the floor, and everybody there just about want to say, I want to give God glory for what he's done for my life today. I want to give God glory for what, and we can't get anybody to say amen. Now, I'm, not, I'm not picking at it like a personality thing. I'm saying, we're not ready. We're not ready for that great noise until we make a little noise. We read the Psalms and we hear about shouting and we hear about giving glory and we read about lifting our hands and praising. We're going to have to start doing it. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm saying because there's so little of it in our church, I'm saying everybody in the sound of my voice, go before God and say, stir my old cold heart. Stir up my old cold heart. And I don't care if somebody says I'm acting like a holy roller. I don't care if somebody says this. I don't care because I want to do I want to be ready, and I want to be walking in the power and the majesty of the blood of Jesus Christ when I walk. Amen. We're his people. We're his people, and he's calling us. There's a big X, April 8th, coming across this nation. It's just another sign. The top of Texas is still on fire. The Middle East is just it's crazy, absolutely crazy. The snow in California, 10 feet of snow. Come on, let's hear what God's saying. All opposition, any pushback, any opinions in your own family, you're going to have to put it on hold. I'm not saying be mean. I'm saying, Lord, I pray that you'll cause them to think about what they said. I'm asking you, Lord, to make them not feel that way. 
But if you don't, I'm still going. I'm, I'm still going the way I'm going. I'm still saying what I said. He put in, remember what psalmist? He put a new song in my heart. I got new things to say. One more time. Deny all opposition and pushback from self, family, and friends. And single-heartedly press forward. No turning back. No turning back. That's what we sing. It's almost too late. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. I'm winding up. Second Thessalonians 2. It's right after the four little short books. Right after Colossians. Listen to this. I could preach all day, so I'm just going to read it to you. 2 Thessalonians 2. I'm not going to start it. Okay, verse 12. That's Timothy. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. Here we go again. By any means, for that day shall not come. He's telling these people that some of them are saying, he's already come, he's already come, or it's right at the door. He's saying, don't be deceived. It's not going to come until these things happen. Now open your ears up. Will not come except there come a great falling away first. Christians leaving the church, quit going to church, denying their faith. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And I don't know but what that's already in the process. He opposeth and exalteth himself above everything that's called God or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Our churches are full of that right now. There are people in full churches that are just absolutely sure they're on the right track. They're sure they've got the most beautiful praise you've ever heard. They have a spirit that goes through and they lift their hands and they're also full of worship. And not one of them knows the scriptures. Not one of them knows intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ. They have the biggest emotionalism. It's right here. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who letteth or he who restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. And personally, I think that happened in about 1770, 1780. I think that the restrainer was removed. I know most people, most theologians say that's the Holy Spirit in the church and that's when the rapture happens and it could be. Something happened. Something happened back there and a restraint was removed because literally all hell has broken loose. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the, with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Listen, why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Not a big beautiful chorus and the most beautiful worship music and the lovely kids and skinny jeans and eye makeup. None of that. A love of the truth. That hurts, Terry. But I feel closer to God. That's the word. I'm going to go home and study that. That's the word of God. I want to know the truth. I don't want to be told I look pretty. I want to be told your hair's messed up. I want to be told you need to tighten, you need to button your jacket. I need to tell me the truth. We need to say that in our spirits. You don't want to go out of the house with toilet paper hanging out of your pants. You want somebody to be frank and tell you. The same here. We need the truth. Listen to what he says. He says, Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion so that they'll believe a lie. So that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. That's the people all around us. Can't sit quietly any longer. You're going to have to start praying in your heart, Lord, stir me up. Stir me up, put a new song in my mouth, and let me realize most people aren't going to want to hear that new song. But let me realize there are those that have to hear it. Otherwise, someday, what if I were to experience something worse than hell? Write these down, and we'll not go to them. Matthew 24, 3 through 13, Jesus tells us what to look for in these days. Matthew 24, 
verses 3 through 13. It's Jesus himself talking to the disciples, telling them what it's going to look like before he comes back. Then Revelation 13, 11 through 18, talks about where we are today with the central bank digital currency and the, the, electric, the electricity consumption of artificial intelligence and, and with the crisscrossing of the solar eclipse. And I'll close with Acts 26. Acts 26. Paul's on trial. And he's standing before Agrippa and Festus. And listen, he's, he's here. I so relate to this. I love this passage. Paul is where he went to be. He's standing, he's, he's, he's made his appeal to Caesar. And he's in the last process of it. And knowing they're about to take his head off. He's probably realized by now, I'm here to be executed. But that's just the flesh. Listen, here's what he was thinking. This is what was in his heart. This is what drove the Apostle Paul all the way to the end of the book. He's saying in his heart, I'm here to tell even Caesar that Jesus Christ died for his sins. And that there is a living God. And that drove him. And he started churches all over the world on the way to Rome from Jerusalem. That was his whole motivation. Now, just like me, <laughs> you, you take me somewhere and there's a group of people if, and, and, and people are talking. It happened at the jail the other day at the, at the, in the, the sheriff's department. And somebody says, they ask you to say something. <laughs> you get to testifying. You get testifying, you can't shut up. Oh, the Lord took alcohol away from me. The blood of Jesus was applied, and I thought I knew it, but I didn't. And when it happened, everything changed. My mind got clean. Pornography fell off like an old rag off my body. It's a just cleansing of the heart, everything. It just kept going, keep going. Well, it says here, Paul's preaching away. He gets his opportunity in verse 24 of chapter 26. He says, and as he thus spoke for himself, testifying is what he was doing, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul! Thou art beside thyself. I've heard that a time or two. Thou art beside thyself. Thy much learning hath made thee mad. I had never been accused of being too smart. But they called him mad. You've, you've studied this stuff. You've studied this Jesus and, you, and you've, you've read the, the prophecies and, 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 and the Torah. You've read it till you're crazy in the head. And he says, no, I'm not mad, most noble Festus. But I speak forth the words of truth. And soberness. For the king knows. The king knows these things. Agrippa, he says, the king knows these things. Before whom I also speak freely. I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing wasn't done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. And Agrippa said to him, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He couldn't shut up. He's talking to the most powerful men in Rome. And one of them says, Paul, stop it. You're about to make me be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today were both almost and all together such as I am except for these chains you've got on me. I wish every one of you were as crazy as me about Jesus and you knew what he'd done. That's every one of us. That's every one of us. Leave here today different. All that is is an act of faith. Because you're already different. Every one of you who've given your life to Christ, you're already a whole new creation. Old things are gone, even if you're still holding on to them and wrapped in them and living in them. Speak by faith and say, Lord, help me come out of that. Help me come out of it. And let me live in a way that even my kids may say, Grandma, thy much learning in the Bible hath made thee mad. And you say, no, darling, grandma's not crazy. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. How many of you can remember grandma or great-grandma and you thought she was nuts? She's awfully religious, blah, 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 blah. Now they're dead and gone, and in your heart you're thinking, what a precious woman. How she changed my heart. I'll never forget what she taught me. You know why? It wasn't that she was a square it wasn't that Grandma hadn't once been beautiful and danced with Grandpa and had a good time. She gave that up and said, it's time for me to be a woman of God. 
It's time for me to quit worrying about how I look or what people think. It's time for me to think about my babies and my grandbabies and put my life on the shelf and see that they come to know the Savior I've come to know. That's where we are today. Let's stand and pray.